So, a uh, show of hands, who here has suffered a scrum meeting? Be honest, there's no shame in it. Like, a scrum meeting. Okay, so in, in a scrum meeting, you're supposed to say what you did the day before and what you're doing that day, and then you're supposed to wait for another hour as like round robin goes around, and then you've wasted the first hour of your day and you've got nothing done. And I had the misfortune of doing these uh, every morning, first thing every day of the work week uh, for several months. And it, it really, really took a, a toll on my soul. Uh, because you know, when, you, when you're talking about doing work, instead of doing the work, it gets really frustrating, right? So um, I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. And so I stopped doing that. And instead, I made this. And I hope that you like it. This is a clone of the Casio 3208 watch module called the Good Watch. Uh, it, it's completely open source and open hardware. Everything is available on GitHub. Um, it's a replacement board that fits within the original Casio watch. So you can have like, a watch that, that's good to wear, that has like, the right uh, metals and materials and all that stuff, is comfortable, has years of battery life. So we're not talking a smartwatch here. And um, at the same time, there's room for additional features. So not only is this programmed in C, and you can have a reverse Polish notation calculator instead of the uh, algebraic one that it came with, but you can also do really crazy stuff, like a disassembler for it, or you can add extra hardware. So this includes um, a 70 centimeter amateur radio. Uh, the next revision runs from 300 megahertz to one gigahertz. Uh, using the watch band itself as a random wire antenna. So you can receive radio signals and you can transmit them and you can use it to help reverse engineer uh, other devices without having to bring out a full software defined radio, without having to pull out your laptop and without having to, uh, to run the, the expensive, power hungry and heavy tools. Because as you're wandering around here, if you have a, a laptop bag and you've got your radios and you've got your antennas, like the weight of all of that can add up. So wouldn't it be nice to just have your entire toolkit on your wrist whenever you might need it in a way that you can forget about it the rest of the, the time? So I'm not the first to make a, a replacement board for a wristwatch, and I'm not the first to play with this radio chip. So uh, as far as background goes, um, there's this thing called the Pluto watch, which is a replacement for the Casio F91W. Uh, this watch is famous because there was um, uh, like a moral panic over them being used in improvised explosive devices, where the, uh, the alarm ringer would set off an explosion, um, prompting even like, um, like TSA warnings about uh, you know, giving extra, extra attention to people wearing the Casio F91. The, um, the Pluto watch also uses uh, an MSP430 related to the one that I'm using, but they add a, a MEMS compass to it. So in addition to uh, running your own code on the watch, you can also tell which way is north just by swinging your wrist around. Um, about 10 years ago, TI came out with the Kronos development kit, uh, which uses the same CPU that I use. Um, the Kronos had a number of problems with it though. It's really heavy and it's really bulky. So you've got uh, a fixed watch band that's uncomfortable. In the summer, your wrist will fill up with sweat. Um, and it doesn't have a, a full keypad. So you need to go through awkward like menu rings in order to reach anything that you like. There's also the, the Faraday RF kit, which again uses the ChipCon 430 chip that I'm using. Um, they had a power amplifier for the 900 megahertz band. So you can just buy one of these things and have a half watt transceiver that's compatible with the wristwatch. Um, their firmware and their hardware are also open source, although uh, little to no code is shared between them and my watch. And then of course, uh, a few years back at, at Torcon, Michael Osmond and I did a, a lecture called Real Men Carry Pink Pagers. Um, it's, it's me on the left and Mike on the right. And we reverse engineered these pink children's text messaging toys in order to make a spectrum analyzer, a garage door opener, a reflexive jammer for APCO P25. Um, the, the radio in these things is not a software defined radio. Like it's not very good for reverse engineering a signal, but after you understand what that signal is, it's an excellent radio for talking to it or for making a receiver or a transmitter 
Um, and then there's the, the RF cat uh, running on the Yardstick 1 hardware. Um, this is by, uh, by Atlas, and Michael Osmond, and those, those folks. This is a nice little tool that allowed you to write your radio definitions in Python on your own workstation uh, while receiving from the real antenna with the real radio. The register settings for the RF cat are compatible with my watch. So you can prototype a receiver in Python on the hardware that's easy to prototype for and then move that definition to run inside of the watch as a radio application that you can keep with you at all times. So when you have an existing watch and you want to replace it, you first need to understand what goes where and why. So the Good Watch 10 left out the radio and was my prototype to, to figure out that the LCD layout was correct, that the, um, the keypad layout was correct. I began by using a micrometer, a vernier caliper, to measure the, all of the dimensions of the PCB. So first I need to know like, how wide it is, how tall it is, where the screw holes are. Uh, and I drew all this out on paper and then recreated it in the CAD software. And I did this for uh, the front of the board, for the back of the board. And then I made my own board that matched those dimensions. So every keypad pin has to be in the same place. Every LCD pin has to be in the same place. Um, into this board I placed the Chipcon 430 F6137. This is the, the CPU of my device. Uh, you can also use the 6147 which is a related chip that's more modern. Uh, but each of these has 32 kilobytes of flash. It has 4 kilobytes of SRAM. It has a built-in LCD driver and a built-in uh, radio and a bootloader ROM that allows you to flash it over a serial port. And all of this comes for free inside of the chip so that I could build the entire watch around a single chip and a couple of support components. Um, it's important to keep it to as few devices as possible because the chip packaging takes a lot of surface area on the board uh, and also a lot of vertical height. So I, I wanted to have room for another chip uh, to have a separate radio and, and CPU. They really had to be the same device. And similarly, I, I sh don't have room for an external LCD controller. So I had to find a part that contained both the CPU and the LCD controller and the radio in a single component in order to fit everything. And that got me uh, a watch with a working display, with uh, working keypad inputs. I initially bootstrapped it by building a watch that has these little blue fly wires coming out of it for reflashing. Uh, this also allows me to read back the dmessage log from the watch. And I use this for all of my software development so that as I'm developing the code, I'm doing it on a tethered watch where temporarily I have no power concerns and where I get full logging. On the uh, left is my recreation of the board, the Good Watch 10. On the right is the original board from, uh, from Casio. And you can see that even though the components are in different places, all of the pads are in identical locations. Uh, because I'm less concerned about the, the cost of the individual PCB, I was able to do uh, silver coating uh, to prevent oxidization. You'll note that the, the copper has sort of dimmed down over the years in the original. Uh, and instead of uh, an epoxy blob, I, I use a QFN chip. I, I drafted this in KeyCAD. Um, so there are no licensing requirements to be able to edit the PCB or to manufacture your own. You can grab the files from the website, send it off to China and receive your own package of 200 boards. Uh, they cost under a dollar a piece if you're doing a quantity above 100. Um, but having the board is only part of it. You also need to know which pins do what. So the, uh, the black bar here that is blocking some of the um, the pins on the far west of the LCD, those pins are called commons. And a common is connected to very many segment pins. Uh, and you can think of this as like a row and column for a driver. And you have very few rows in very many columns. And then they're wired up to, f to fit the individual pixels of the LCD display. So these are the commons and these are the segments. And I recovered these by using sticky tape, or the uh, little sticky notes, right? You take a razor blade and you chop off the end of it. 
And then by sticking this onto the PCB, you can selectively introduce a failure in a, a single pin of the LCD. I had to do this because I don't quite have enough LCD pins on my chip to drive all of the uh, pins of the physical LCD hardware. So I needed to find which pins I could block off while keeping every digit of the display legible. To figure out which pin does what, you just introduce failure in a whole bunch of them at a time. So with the, the black bar there covering the far west pin, I now know that um, a quarter of the LCD pixels will refuse to light. And if I move that just one over, then a different quarter fail to light up. And a little bit further, a different quarter fail to light up. And so on. Um, and whenever you cover up a pin that knocks out a quarter of the pixels, you're covering a common pin. And whenever you cover a pin that knocks out one, two, three, or four of the pixels, then you're covering up a segment pin. And this is how you figure out how to wire it to the chip. You don't actually care about which pixel is connected to which pair yet because you can figure out the rest of that by software. So instead of running through and tapping each and every one of these and measuring which uh, pixels go out at which time, which would take forever, instead I just wired it up in software, lit up all of the pixels and then selectively turned them dim. And then for each dim one I was able to come up with its address, which is which common meets which segment. And that way I was able to write the LCD driver after my hardware prototypes arrived so that they didn't block each other. As far as the software went, MSP430 chips are well supported by GCC and a complete development tool chain is available inside of most standard Linux distributions. So in Debian you can build this firmware either in stable or in testing just by installing the compiler and, and building it. You don't need any external packages or external package sources. The, um, and then the actual programming happens through a serial port. So these little um, test probes that are connected to the sides, those are connected to the pins that allow me to force the chip into its bootloader mode. And then the bootloader appears as a serial port with documented commands. And a Python script can uh, check the model number, erase flash, load in the programming, reboot. It can also dump a copy of RAM so that I can do core boots I can do core dumps from a running watch in order to load a real RAM image into my debugger to see what particular variables were. Or I can um, dump the D message log. So when I run printf, uh, there's no room on the LCD f to cover like the, the full kernel log. So instead printf just writes to a memory buffer and by dumping that memory buffer out I can use printf debugging to see what went wrong. The keypads are implemented by uh, rows and columns again. And whenever you push a button, it connects that row to that column. So if we push the, the upper left button, which is a 7, that will connect pin 2.2 .2 to pin 2.3. And the two will be bridged and there will be a circuit between them. So what we do is we set all of the rows to be input pins and all of the commons to be output pins. And the inputs we pull lightly low and the outputs we pull strongly high. And when they connect, the inputs will jump high and that tells us which column touched which row by then cycling all of the other pins off. And again we implement this as um, a table in which the high nibble of each byte is the, um, the scan code and the low, level of each, the, the low nibble of each byte is the actual ASCII character. So that the driver can return the ASCII character of the key that's being pressed rather than the, um, the scan code. So that your source code can remain readable. Um, power management matters a lot if you're building something that has to run on a 1.6 millimeter thin coin cell battery for years. If I have to replace the battery every day or if I have to recharge the watch every day, it will become too much trouble and I will stop wearing the watch and then I won't really have a wearable. So the main CPU has uh, a variable clock rate. And uh, CMOS chips, when they are digital, um, they waste just a little bit of energy when the transistors flip. So if you have a gate 
when that gate transitions, then a little bit of energy is lost and after the transition and before the transition it's almost perfectly static. It leaks very, very little energy. So the power consumption is almost linear with the clock speed. And a watch doesn't really have to do that much when it's idling. It only needs to display the time. So I can run the entire CPU at 32 kilohertz until momentarily I need more speed and then I'm able to jump it up to 1 megahertz. And then my idle CPU draw can be as small as 5 microamps. I implemented a reverse Polish notation calculator. Um, so like the old uh, Hewlett Packard calculators, whenever you enter a number it pushes it onto the stack. Whenever you hit an operator it pops the last two values off the stack and pushes the result. Um, this allows the calculator to be written quickly and with very small source code. New functions can be added. There's a timer. Um, each of these applications is written as like a, a small little module of C code so that you can fork any application to add new pieces to it. Um, there are bugs though. Because when you implement something like this, the, the documentation says that it's supposed to work a certain way. And then you actually get it running and faults occur. You might have forgotten to check for an error message or there could be a mistake in the documentation. You need a way to debug this so that you can work out all of these kinks and then have a, a stable platform. So one of the applications that I wrote was a hex editor. And the hex editor allows me to view all of the CPU's memory. And it shows, I, I have room for um, eight hexadecimal nibbles on the, the screen. So the left four digits are the address and the right four are the value. I had two of the prototypes of this watch and I was in Budapest and I had no tools with which to work on them. Except for what I could borrow from a, a friendly hacker space. So the, the watch on the left is keeping accurate time and the watch on the right is losing an entire minute every day. And I needed to figure out why. So I used the hex editor to check the error flags of the real time clock value and they all looked good. And then I checked the crystal and I was able to find that the low frequency crystal had faulted and that when the low frequency crystal faults on this chip it defaults to a software backup. And the software backup was wasting a ton of power and inaccurately keeping the time. And I was able to debug this without opening the case or or any of that just by using the hex editor. As long as you have a hex editor you might as well add a disassembler. Uh, so you can disassemble the firmware of the watch on the watch itself and then reverse engineer it with pen and paper. It has a power on self test so every time I've been able to identify like a faulting condition I add a check for that to a routine that runs through and checks all of them at startup and all of them if you press the number 7. This allows me to recognize things like clock faults or things like leaving the radio on uh, that can sabotage the power consumption. Because if a minor bug were to leave anything powered up that oughtn't be, that could wipe the battery out in a day or two and the watch will die. Then we need a radio. Because there's no point in having a fancy watch with a disassembler if it doesn't also give you like a, a really cool tool on the side. To add a radio to the non-radio version, I needed to add uh, a crystal. Uh, it's a 26 megahertz crystal that provides the timing needed for the, the phase lock loops and the other uh, analog pieces of the radio. And I also needed a filter chain. Um, without the filter chain, when you transmit, you would also transmit on harmonic frequencies because the digital chip can produce a square wave but not very well um, a sine wave. So the original radio models are restricted to the band between 430 and 435 megahertz because of a bandpass filter. The upcoming version extends this to support the full range of the chip by using a low pass filter above the 900 megahertz band. So you will transmit harmonics if you transmit in the, the lower frequencies. Um, this causes no trouble for reception. I needed an antenna. So this little green wire here in the back actually connects the watch band as a random wire antenna. So that the watch band is the antenna for all reception and transmission. This is not a very good antenna, but it is more than good enough. 
In tests, we were able to transmit Morse code across four city blocks in West Philadelphia, um, received indoors. Now, radio software also has to be carefully considered. If you're building your first watch from my design, um, you'll get the digital parts working before you have the radio properly wired up. So it needs to gracefully downgrade. Right? When, you, um, when the watch powers up, if it's unable to start that 26 megahertz radio crystal, if it can't fire that up, it assumes that it's not populated, and then it disables all radio features. Or if you need a model that you can wear inside of a skiff, you can just not populate that component, and then you have a non-radio watch. It was also very important to have a way to quickly uh, prototype radio functions separately from the GUI. Um, for those purposes, the watch can be assembled with a built-on chip antenna outside of a wristwatch, and then uh, all of the firmware can be communicated with over a serial port so that you can ask it to receive packets or transmit packets. And in this way, you can prototype any new protocol entirely in software as a desktop Python application without having to involve the, f um, the GUI of the watch. So you don't need to push the teeny little buttons to try the thing when you're trying to get it to work for the very first time. There's also uh, code plugs. There's a text file that lists all of the frequencies that you might use. And then you can use this text file to um, add your own channels, your own um, uh, things that you're interested in uh, to tune between them in the tuner application. Radio power management also matters a lot. Uh, I told you before that with the radio off, the CPU con consumes five microamps at 32 kilohertz and 160 microamps at one megahertz. Just receiving, not transmitting, takes 15,000 microamps. Transmitting can cost up to twice that, although for a shorter period of time, because you can shut the radio off after your transmission completes. This is a ton of power by comparison. Um, it's for this reason that I can't really write a uh, like set it and forget it pager application. Right? The, the watch can't be idly listening because idly listening costs a ton of power. Transmitting is a lot easier because it's only using energy for the time that you push down the button. So we have a Morse code mode where you can push the, uh, the side of the watch as a Morse code key and then send that to any single sideband receiver uh, within range. So here we have uh, Yesu 817, and we had this set up at a bar, and then um, my buddy took the watch four blocks from the bar and was saying hello in Morse code, and we accurately received it. You can also send more complicated packets. This is a GMSK transmission that we use as like a, a fast data rate packet format for the uh, dumping larger files. So uh, one of our contributors is working on dumping the dmessage log over the radio so that in debugging we can just ask the watch to flush its logs out and then have a desktop nearby with a receiver to catch those logs and record them. Uh, this can also be used for automated real world power management. So like, if I want to record the battery of a watch dying over a long period of time, then I can put a reduced capacity battery into a watch and set it to transmit its voltage every night at midnight and get a nice little graph of the voltage falling over time. Now, this is great for talking to like abstract things. But in addition to abstract things, you also want to talk to specific things, right? So um, I bought a relay controller. Um, all of these cheap relay controllers seem to use they seem to use like the, the same protocol of sending either a, a wide burst for a one and a short burst for a zero or the other way around. Uh, I call this the, the eights and e's code because if you debug it, uh, if you receive it with accurate timing and you assume that they're a uh, nibble wide, then the long ones become e's, like one, 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 zero, and the short ones become eights or one, zero, zero, zero. Um, you can reverse engineer these using Universal Radio Hacker. Uh, connected to any SDR, and then it takes a recording and allows you to zoom in and out on the signal. You can change the thresholds, you can change the encoding. Uh, you're basically just trying to measure the width of one short bit. So uh, here I have a short bit selected. And then once you know that width, you're able to 
uh, program your own radio transmitter to mimic the signal, which you copy out as a packet in hexadecimal. So the result of that will be this set of, of register values, which are compatible with the RF cat. So you can take anything that's been reverse engineered to talk to an RF cat and you can then port it over to the watch. You also need the packets themselves. So uh, here we have four strings broken apart into eight lines and um, e these are for the A, B, C and D buttons of the, of the transmitter. And then at the end of it you have um, like a, a working signal that you can send. Um, you can also uh, send this between devices, right? So the, uh, here I'm transmitting as Morse code to my handheld radio, the Kenwood D74. Or you can use it for um, receiving on the reverse engineering end. So uh, this cute little black radio on the left that's like a bit thicker but almost as small as my watch. You can buy these uh, online from China and they arrive and um, they just call them walkie talkies. And they don't tell you what frequencies they use and they're not externally programmable. Um, but it would be really handy to know what frequency it's on because if no one else is using it maybe that would be cool for you or maybe you want to move it over. So the watch in the middle is running a frequency counter application that tells me that the, um, the transmitting frequency is 450 megahertz. And uh, the Kenwood on the right has found that it's actually uh, 450.05 megahertz. But this is really close, right? We're off by 50 kilohertz. And all the time of trying to guess what the frequency would be, of having to set up a, a waterfall on a software defined radio, all of that can be skipped just by asking the wristwatch what frequency the transmitter next to it is running. Um, I use this at B-Sides Knoxville uh, and in order to figure out what the frequency of the two-way radios they were using was. Uh, so that then I could call the staff on their own radios, having reverse engineered their frequencies without using a, a desktop or a software defined radio or a laptop or anything heavy. Uh, the only tools that I used for reverse engineering this were my watch and my uh, handheld. You can also hit uh, other items. So like this is a, uh, a doorbell that I've reverse engineered to be remote controlled by my wristwatch. And I can be sitting on the couch at home and just reach over and knock the thing off and it, it ding-dongs, you know. Um, th th so many things that can be done with this platform. Once the, the basic problems of power management and radio access are solved, and all of those have been solved in this project. We have clean C source code that is well commented and well documented. The wiki explains how individual applications were written. Um, the development environment is simple enough that you can now sit down and write a feature in, the af in an afternoon. Um, last Friday I implemented uh, Shabbos mode for this. So you can actually turn off the keypad and the side button and have no buttons that you might accidentally press that would change even a single transistor until the uh, recessed button on the side is pressed to exit the mode. Um, you can reverse engineer radio protocols and port them over. So any uh, on off keyed 2FSK or 4FSK transmitter or receiver can be re-implemented on this platform first in quickly prototyped Python and then re-implemented in standalone C. Isn't that nifty? Okay. Uh, code is available on GitHub. The uh, source code is available as well. Um, the third revision of the watch has will be arriving on Monday which adds uh, additional frequencies for the 900 megahertz band and the 300 megahertz band. And have at it. Thank you kindly. Um, this is Ruger. He's a very good dog. Another round for Ruger please. So I've finished with plenty of time to spare. Do we have any questions? Yes? Did you order the PCBs already uh, assembled or did you assemble it themselves? Because when you published the, the, the codes, I tried to assemble it 
but uh, uh, there's uh, uh, like I needed the microscopic so 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 the dream and so on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I have no plans to manufacture this, but the license allows it. Uh, if Seed Studio or anyone wants to manufacture this, they have my blessing. Um, I made this as a hobby project because I thought it would be cool. I really enjoy designing electronics and building them at home, but I do not enjoy dealing with the hassles of manufacturing. Like, if you want me to do that, you really have to pay me. Um, for the um, so. But no, there, there are no pre-assembled boards available so far. Uh, if you can find a student who's good with soldering or, or has um, the microscope eyes and the steady hands, um, you might also try um, like, uh, fixing equipment problems. Like uh, if you have brighter lights or if you have a better vice or maybe you need like, more coffee or less whiskey or, uh, or those sorts of things. The soldering on this is rather difficult. It's um, 0201, which um, American, not metric. It's not that bad. But it is uh, two mils long and one mil wide for some of the smaller components. Uh, you will need very bright lights and steady hands and solder paste or a flex pen. Uh, do not use lead-free solder. That's a communist conspiracy. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Sorry, the uh, the software for now you should just be running everything from the Git master. The software is backward compatible with every hardware release, so um, it like, we've not broken hardware compatibility at all yet. The um, the new boards that arrive Monday add uh, a better ground plane stitching, so the battery ought to work even as it gets lower, so the, the life will increase. And then the revision after that adds the, the wider radio bands, and that requires a different set of components. Yes? Uh, with your typical usage, what battery runtime do you get? Uh, so the question is, uh, what battery lifetimes do I get with my typical usage? And the answer is that it, it varies by what I'm doing and by uh, whether there are any hardware faults. So for example, I missoldered the resistor in one of my units. And then whenever I send a radio transmission, the radio transmission would be really squeaky quiet and the battery life would just drop off of a cliff. Um, for units which do not have physical faults, I'm getting battery life on the order of like two or three years, I think. Um, they're, they no longer die from old age. When I have them die, it's because of a software bug or because I screwed up somewhere. Uh, and the software bugs are becoming fewer and further between. So, great. Thank you kindly.